What's up guys, Adele here with Traders Brawl in collaboration with Web3 TV. I'm so excited for my new guest, Jamil Shanawi, who is a serial entrepreneur uh, and co-founder of Ahoy, which we'll, uh, we're about to get into in a second. But for those who are new, uh, Traders Brawl is a educational podcast uh, focusing on fitness, financial freedom, lifestyle, uh, Web3 as well, and um, that's what we're here to talk about. So without further ado, Jamil, I'm so glad we have met a couple of times. Um, and I'm really fascinated by your um, entrepreneurship journey, as well as the 2469 community, which I've been to myself and I visited, and now I finally get to have you as a guest. So talk, us about, talk, talk to us about who you are and what you're doing here in Dubai. Well, it's very simple. I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is what I've been doing all my life. Uh, I never had any other jobs, uh, per se. I started really early when I was 14. So uh, probably the only thing I did in, on the side was like, while having a startup, I taught as well uh, in, a, in a university. I was a lecturer. Oh, okay. um, but other than that, I did some consulting uh, for disaster mitigation. Okay. But uh, that's about it. Uh, Ahoy is my 24th startup. The number might seem big, but uh, the truth is fell fast. Mm. So I had a couple of years between startups where I actually attempted to start two or three different companies, self-funded from my previous exit. I typically do um, a 10-10-80 split, 80% reinvest uh, on my exit money, 10% to fund my life and my family. The other thing goes into the new idea. Um, I do not want to fund my startup too long, if you know what I mean. You you want to just fund it to have legs right. and then see if it actually can go around right. and people would put their money or not. Right. Let's talk a bit about Ahoy then. Um, so Ahoy is your latest venture. Um, how long has Ahoy been around? Uh, I mean, without the name as an idea, it's been there since 2008. Okay. So uh, it's been under cooking and brewing for a very long time. Okay. At least to say. Uh -huh. um, I actually made a mistake while writing an algorithm from a book. Uh, and the result was interesting. So I decided, you know, I'm just going to go for it and explore this even further. It took me around eight additional years to do that. And then um, I decided I'm going to build a team around this. But I didn't have time, uh, which is the most difficult thing to obtain. Mm. Um, so I had a company that I just exited, but I had some duties um, pertaining to that. I was building a company. And I had a hoi as well. Happening. At the same time? At the same Three time. Three companies? Three companies. <laughs> and I got rid of the obligations I had. I went, I started actually uh, trying to see if uh, the, my current project was doing well. Uh, it was a company called Volicon. Uh, it employs AI into construction and uh, ready mix concrete technology. And uh, I handed it over to an executive team, very capable team. It went on its way, and I started the whole in 2018. And that almost took 10 years to get from idea to project, which is extremely long, right. and I do not advise anybody to do that. But then Ahoy started growing, and I mean, at, we had, we thought we would shut down Ahoy at least 18 times. If mm. I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. So, um, but today Ahoy is a profitable company in more than 68 countries, uh, clients in more than 68 geographies. And uh, you never know uh, what could actually um, happen with your idea. A lot of people tell us we don't know what Ahoy is. And yeah, I understand because the average Joe is not really the uh, typical client. Um, Ahoy is a deep tech company. We do a lot of algorithmic development. Um, engineers love us. Mm. Projects managers as well. And uh, governments actually recently. Uh, they 
build a lot of solutions using this uh, tech stack that we have. And it is not into any sector. That's the truth. Um, so we didn't receive any VC money because we are not. We couldn't be placed in a box. We're not consumer uh, startup. And the tech is already active in like aviation, logistics, and supply chain trading, by the way, as well. Um, so we do a lot of uh, routing and a lot of uh, optimization as well for uh, huge data sets. Um, we can reduce computing as well. Um, so it is a true infrastructure company and uh, that I think is the determining factor in the region. I mean, uh, uh, it's not quite common that companies like this start from the Middle East. So it's been uh, quite a challenge to actually keep the company alive. Luckily, we had a lot of people who believed in us. Some right. of them, from my previous investments, invested again. They just like have this blind trust in what I'm doing. But a lot of other people saw the value and impacted their businesses, family offices, and then they decided they would go ahead and mm. invest in Ahoy. Right, and when, when they invest, I mean, you dilute the, the shares because you have to give shares away in exchange for the investment, is that right? Equity. Yeah. So um, are there any majority shareholders that sort of control the company or you maintain full control over it? Yeah, I mean, if, if that happened, that would be an exit technically. Right. Um, like, mm. So no, no, definitely no. I mean, um, they all ha all of our investors luckily had the sophistication to understand that. Um, we're, almost a unicorn now and uh, I hate the unicorn status to be honest. Why? I just think it's the wrong metric to look at. <sighs> I mean a billion dollars today is not a billion dollars a year ago. Yeah, it's value true. wise. Right? Value wise. So uh, I just think it, it's a toxic metric and inflamed by you know failed startup and tech media we have here in the region especially and uh, I don't see the other. Mm -hmm. Show me value. Don't show me valuation. Mm, real value. Exactly. And what are you actually building and helping? Exactly. And how sustainable is it? Or are you just building another app to, you know, uh, technocrats build some apps to just come. And they're not really elevating anything. Uh, they're just mm. uh, monopolizing a certain vertical mm -hmm. and making everybody's life difficult. The profitable sectors become money losing for some reason. So I am not. I have a. I have some controversial opinions when it comes to some of the verticals. Um, we love controversial opinions in yeah. this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, let me add fuel to your fire. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned as well in one of the pre pre previous meetups that I've been in, twenty four six nine, which is a wonderful community. Um, you know, m most startups, uh, the status quo is you need to be solving a problem. What is your view on that? Definitely that's only half of the number of ways you can do it. I mean, and who says that there is a number of ways to do it? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have a lot of smart, innovative people and they can actually go and build and create new stuff and find new ways to do things. Uh, I don't think, I, I don't like anything that's set in stone. Mm. Uh, it's anti-innovation, it's anti-creating something new. Um, in my opinion, there are two ways that I've personally experienced. One is, yeah, you solve a problem and the other one, you follow your vision. Not every idea has to start with solving a problem. Mm. You can uh, follow a vision that changes the status quo. Yes, eventually you'll be solving a problem, but Eventually. you're not solving for a problem per se. Mm. Um, and I think these are the two different types. A lot of the sophisticated investors, especially in North America, understand that. Uh, in the region, it didn't become a uh, accepted opinion yet, in my opinion. Um, but I think there are a few far in between that actually can see it, investors-wise. Founders, unfortunately, in our region, they only want to build to please investors. Mm. So they build as per what investors tell them yes. is their criteria. And that, Not their vision. No, nah, right? that's a big issue. Right, right. So building on to my next question about Ahoy, what 
problem, if at all, is Ahoy solving and how is it monetizing? So it, the problem here depends on who you are. So for the engineer, it's solving the uh, knowledge gap of not knowing mathematics and physics and operational sciences to translate that into code and how to solve issues and optimize and orchestrate. So it acts as an orchest orchestration tech stack, replaces a part of your logic as well if you're writing logic uh, at the back end. Mm. So it introduces a lot of efficiencies, not only on the OPEX, but also on the CAPEX when you're developing a solution or a system. Um, if you're building hardware, there are other use cases. If you are in FinTech or uh, in uh, DeFi, there are a lot of different cases and use cases as well in there. Um, for starting from uh, cross-chain and liquidity all the way to uh, efficient uh, Web3, truly decentralized databases, um, we also have uh, optimization that can actually make efficient a lot of encryption technologies. Uh, we have uh, uh, algorithms that can uh, establish secure open communication networks, especially uh, satellite to ground stations. So we, and if you look at these different use cases that I mentioned, probably only three algorithms that share all of these use cases. But more recently, we've seen a lot of countries uh, utilize our technology to orchestrate the uh, traffic of a country, the whole traffic, Interesting. in a multimodal, intermodal uh, manner. They have been uh, developing their own ITS solutions, intelligent traffic systems. Uh, the dependency on big suppliers from large enterprises and hundreds of millions of dollars bills became something of the past. Uh, they can own their IP built on top of a tech stack that enables them to do so as well now. So um, there are as well uh, OEMs from automotive and uh, motorbike companies that actually started building their own tech now for their vehicles using our tech stack. So you find this extremely diversified. There isn't a certain problem that we solve. We are a party. You take us, you shape us, whatever you actually want to solve a problem with. So yeah, it, it does have a mode of action, but that mode of action depends on the case. Uh, it solves so many different problems, basically. I see, I see. And, and where does the um, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service come in? Because are these also products that you sell at Ahoy? So these are the business models we sell at. Okay. You're right. And, um, we basically uh, allow people to come, or how we make our revenues, either through our partners. So we work through partners. We don't work directly with most of our clients, except very few, um, like governments, for example, and NGOs. Uh, but other than that, uh, we actually work directly with some startups as well, because we're quite passionate about that. Uh, other than that, it, it typically goes down to um, our partners either giving you an on-premise uh, installation of our tech stack, or you go and just consume it directly from the cloud. Now, the most interesting thing about the whole Ahoy tech stack and the whole realm of Ahoy, we do not process any personally identifiable information whatsoever. And that has been a challenge in the industry in general. Uh, we don't uh, actually do anything that could identify any of our users. If you ask me, who is using which API, I would actually find it difficult to know on my own cloud. Uh, well, not difficult, near impossible actually. Uh, without me going back to billing and trying to trace that back. And then even then, I don't know what you're using it for. Interesting. Well, I mean, that, it's, it's a good way of preserving privacy for the user. Yeah, yeah and thanks to Web3 and uh, mm. we, we've been collaborating with uh, an amazing uh, um, North American startup known as uh, Source.network. They actually have uh, an amazing uh, um, open source database uh, system. And uh, they actually made this extreme, extremely on the decentralized end of things. Uh, while before we thought we are doing things decentralized, but we weren't. Mm -hmm. True decentralization is, uh, I mean, uh, people say Web 2, Web 3, and I think uh, 
Adu, the founder of Source, said it uh, the best. He said, uh, "Open web." Right. I think that's the dream. Open right. web. Open web. Definitely. Yeah. And and speaking of Web three, which is read, write, and own, I think we can now talk a bit about Web three. Um, is Ahoy doing anything with Web three itself, or separately from you being an NGO investor yourself? So, Ahoy is actively investing and collaborating and partnering with a lot of startups in Web3, but um, the Ahoy tech stack is agnostic. Right. I mean, we don't care if it's on board a satellite, uh, in a server in underground or on the cloud, uh, Web3, Web2, whatever it is, embedded even, we actually it actually can be deployed. Right. So we do not really um, um, we're not really exclusive to anything, we're quite agnostic by nature. We're agnostic to developers' stacks, we're agnostic to clouds, we're agnostic to almost everything. But we do have a huge support internally and there's a huge movement within the team and all, our, all of our engineering is actually pro-decentralization. Very nice. And to your understanding, and maybe for the audience, what is your understanding of decentralization? Why is it important? I mean, the web is the virtual world and um, sovereignty in a way is what's happening in Web 2 is almost like what happened in the real world when borders started be, to be drawn. We realize that different nations need to protect the privacy of their citizens and that is a need. That need was only created because uh, corporates were not, companies and startups and corporates were not responsible in the way they obtained, processed and leveraged their user data. Right. The Web3 is a completely different realm and the open web eventually, in my opinion. That issue does not exist and that's why it is a win-win-win in my opinion. Yes, you cannot be targeted on ads like they do today, for example. Mm -hmm. But it is a more, um, it's, a, it's a space where equality can be achieved for people who are actually using the internet. Um, financial equality, um, equality in the way you, your data is processed, uh, equal opportunity uh, and social mobility even. But, uh, so social mobility is your ability to actually go up and down the social strata by merit of achievement. So I believe Web3 and Open Web does pave the way, the, the, pave the way properly to that. Mm -hmm. I think um, the nature of it being, uh, like you mentioned privacy, the nature of no central authority being in control of any particular blockchain, any particular uh, ledger where all the data records are kept, um, that again serves to the, the benefits of privacy and security and having control in a way. So it, we'll see how this plays out because I think we're still scraping the surface, scratching the surface as, um, you know, Bitcoin itself is only a decade old, right? Uh, you don't have to necessarily invest in Bitcoin, but knowing what the technology does and how it's replacing, uh, you know, the jobs that require an intermediary, that's um, yeah, a growing space. There certainly is, and uh, you can see how uh, the same issues that engineers are worried about when it comes to the open web are already happening in the crypto space in compliance. Right. I mean, it's almost near impossible to do compliance without making it difficult or impossible uh, to use crypto as a, a viable currency. Yeah. I know, and the thing that most of the crypto community uh, share when it comes to why why invest in crypto, you know, why what is crypto, and what is the, the essence behind it, what's the substance behind it, when it's you know um, it's un untangible, you know, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't do anything with it, and and you know it's just trying to like explain it to a little a little child, trying to say like you know for for a child's from a child's perspective. If you were to ask the child, what's more important to you? Like, a, this is an example that was given to me earlier. $300,000 house 
or three hundred thousand dollars worth of skin uh, in a in a in a CS Counter Strike because they're, they're playing Counter Strike every day. What do you think the kid would answer? Skin. Skin, right? Oh, I get this new skin. I get these new guns. I get these new because that's what's important to the child, right? The child grew up in this virtual environment. Yeah, it it, it does have value and. Even in economics, the value is perceived by utility. Right. So if you can utilize it, it's then more valuable to you. Right. Um, but uh, everybody who has a cry about how Bitcoin is valued and it's intangible, well, actual currencies are un intangible as well. And if you tell me that the dollar has gold behind it, I'll tell you, really? Did you really check? <laughs> Did you check? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much, how, much is it, how much does the government actually have in the treasuries? Because they say, you know, it's dollar backed, right? Which means it's you, central bank backed. It means the central bank has lots of money inside the safe. But we never checked. <laughs> I mean, if you compare uh, currencies that are uh, pegged to their GDP value-wise, right. uh, compare that to mining, mm -hmm. You can see the similarities. I, I don't think it's far-fetched, mm. uh, understanding-wise. Right. The issue of crypto is that it is not centralized. And that's the issue for mm. uh, regulators, I, I believe. It's a tough transition for them. Mm. Um, the issue, or the, I'm sorry, not the issue, but the uh, pro here for uh, people who use the currency is that it is decentralized. Yeah. And that's, I think, where... Navigating that, yeah. those two conflicts, yes. Um, moving on to you being an angel investor. Um, so that means you invest in early stage startups, I'm guessing uh, tech ones, uh, particularly with a focus on... I want to know how... Um, when, when, when did you firstly make your first angel investment? And what was it on? Um, so when I did... My first exit, I took the money. I was 16. Okay. And uh, I invested in two different companies. One of them was developing a chemical that makes uh, fabric uh, flame proof. Okay. And uh, the other one uh, was a company that designed an early version of the electrical scooter with a battery backpack that you actually wore as a backpack. Interesting. Um, and I, uh, the rest of the money went to my second startup. So the, these were the two first startups I had. I, I, I was passionate about the, uh, uh, the nature of how they came up with their designs. Um, the scooter one didn't really work out, but then the f fabric flame retardant coating or whatever it's called, it actually picked up and uh, it was even used in Mecca to uh, protect the tents. There were fires, frequent fires uh, in Mecca, oh. a lot of people died. Right. Uh, a lot of hotels such as Acre and uh, Holiday Inn started using them in smoking rooms uh, for the beds because some people smoked in the bed and fires mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it quite picked up and the guys got UL listing, which is like the rubber stamp certification for, for it being proper. And they got acquired from a larger uh, North American uh, uh, materials company. I do have a passion for like coatings, corrosion, whether sacrificial or not, uh, material science, uh, my my third startup was actually a material discovery algorithm. So I, I created an algorithm that can discover new uh, composites uh, from hydrocarbons. And uh, a new type of nail polish came out of it, new types of adhesives came out of it. And uh, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy doing stuff like that. Uh, I like to go up in the value chain, me personally, when I'm creating things. Mm. And the things I invest in, I truly like deep tech and hard tech. Um, I mean, yeah, the failure, the failure rate uh, is high. Uh, the success or the, pro, uh, the company life cycle to success is quite long as well, most mm. of the times. Mm. But the payback is huge as well, not just financially. Right, of course. Um, 
I think there's a lot of learned lessons here along the way, of course, that you, you take on with you every, every time you are um, investigating a new project to invest in. Um, so, you know, fast forward to now, what sort of um, criteria that have set, set your mindset uh, before you uh, invest in a new company? You know, what sort of criteria that they need to meet? Um, are there any specific ones? So I'm, I'm stopping angel investing because I'm going into uh, this new fund that we're starting called Actual Venture Capital. Right. Um, but before I just stopped recently, I, all the investments, I, I just care about the people there. Uh, who are, like, not who, but can we, like, sit down and have a cup of coffee, really? Yeah. Can we really talk? Can we connect? Connect. And if we could, uh, how, uh, what's your thinking style? Yeah. You might, your idea might not be working today, yeah. but you might be onto something. Right. That, that is what I like to get behind. Right. I, I don't care if you don't, if you don't have any revenues or product market fit, but I did invest in companies that were also profitable. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, you need the diversification at the end of the day. Um, you need to invest in people you like to work with, and if you don't, you will just be miserable. Um, you always try to, life is too short to work with assholes, you know? Right. And uh, if you work with people that you can't connect with, then you could become one too. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what I try, try to avoid, not instinctively, but after doing this actually as a couple of mistakes. Interesting. It's, just, it's, it's an interesting take. Um, people 100% play a role in this. And I like that you take the, it's interesting you take an angle of, you know, the human aspect rather than the valuation aspect of it. And like you said, value over valuation. Um, uh, coming from like a, a financial background, you know, I would look at metrics, I would look at traction, I would look at where your predictions, your financial forecasts, um, as well as, uh, yeah, uh, metrics I would start with. And then I would start with partnerships and how, how big are your numbers on social media, if you have. And then... I mean, that's logical. Mm. If you're investing in something that is not a zero to one, not the first time. Yes. So it's been established, the, metric, the matrices are um, benchmarked, you can actually benchmark, benchmark. Um, yeah, so when you're given a number, you can actually benchmark that. Right. right. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so yeah, then it's, it's fair, but that's completely off my target. Uh, my target is to go more on zero to one stuff. Like things that haven't been built before. Haven't been built before. And yeah, maybe the success rate is lower, but mm. the return is way higher. Mm. Um, this is the area of the 200, 300, and 400 X returns. Right. When it happens, if it happens. Right. right. Um, and I also learned after a while that you can salvage a lot of value with these projects as well. Why? Because even if a project does fail, you can actually do your own portfolio, merger acquisitions, and turnarounds as well. So it sounds more like private equity than venture capital, for sure, but it is worth it, especially right. for progress and the betterment of my kind. You can actually do a lot of amazing things. Right, right. Let's uh, turn our attention now into more lifestyle mode. Um, so as a person with who is you know, on your 24th startup, you were previously an angel investor, and you're now launching a new fund called Actual. Um, how does how do you uh, manage your lifestyle outside of work? Do you have a way of switching off, or are you always on? And is it always as you come come and go? Do you have power naps? Do you have certain diets? How do you manage all this uh, hecticness? <laughs> um, I'm I'm a very simple person. I. Uh... I try to eat when I when I want to eat. Okay. And, uh, I I don't eat a lot. I mean, recently, uh, I don't know if you remember when you met me. I was way bigger. I can't remember, but you always looked in shape. Uh, no, uh, my fat ass was seventy kilos more. <laughs> okay. I was seventy kilos more. Really? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, when I'm under stress, I uh, I gain a lot of weight, and I was under a lot of stress building a hoy. Mm. Uh, but that phase is now behind us, and we have stabilized the ship now. Very nice. 
Um, so I'm on this perpetual yo-yo wait, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, and I can't. I just can't work out. I mean, I'm, some people have bless them. They have the will power to actually do this. If actually, it helps them to cope with their stress. Stress. Me no. Uh, I think mainly the basic reason goes back to uh, my sleeping schedule. Okay. I only sleep three to four hours a night. Wow. And I work seven days a week. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, the last time I took a time off was two weeks in 2018, in February. And then after that, I came back and started the hoy. And uh, I do not uh, know how, I'm probably very bad with my time management. Right. But I am very productive. Okay. I do read a lot. And that's, I think, my uh, my switch off. I play a lot of paddle tennis. Paddle tennis, yes. Uh, yes. Do jog as well. And uh, I try to at least do a few kilometers here and there. Uh, well, previously between our offices here in JLT, but uh, more recently now we're moving into one single office, so probably I'm going to have to find time to do that right. with running between meetings. Mm. But I'm deeply into biohacking yes. uh, and I try to eat smart. Um, so uh, yeah, I eat fast food, but not just not more than once a month, maybe. Um, I, 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 I don't like to eat more than three or four hours a day in a window of three to four hours a day. and. Uh, it's just uh, I, I I don't I don't do breakfast. I, I don't know. I don't like it. Interesting. It uh, makes me feel lazy, and then I feel I need a nap, so I don't do naps as well. Uh, if if I, I take a nap, it just ruins my day. Uh, to me, the best thing to do is uh, wake up, spend an hour quiet, and then drink a lot of water and. Take my mushrooms. I take uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like uh, lion's mane, uh, cordyceps, uh, chaga. So these are not shrooms, right? These are shrooms. normal eat, eating mushrooms. Yeah, but uh, they're uh, they're known as uh, nootropics. Uh, oh. Uh, they actually are they stimulate life. cognitive. Oh, yeah. oh, they're life changing. Interesting. Um, and I. Do also enjoy, uh, especially when I'm like dehydrated, you know, when the weather is really hot and uh, it's been going like stressful, caffeine. Uh, I do the occasional IV drip as well. Um, What's that? The, uh, IV drips. IV drips. What is that yeah. exactly? Actually, so uh, there are a lot of those uh, uh, on Instagram and on the web, but. Uh, the, the best one I've tried is the most classical one. It's known as a Myers cocktail. So it's just an IV line. It's a lot of uh, normal saline. And then they usually put a cocktail of vitamins. Uh, nothing high dose except vitamin C. Interesting. Uh, there is uh, glucathione there as well. Uh, alpha lipoic acid. Um, and uh, alpha-lipoic acid is uh, an extremely potent um, um, uh, antioxidant. Mm. And it also regulates your glucose as well. Um, oh, good. So I actually invested in a few uh, um, biomedical companies that are trying to pave the way into biohacking. Um, I've invested in a company as well that was trying to take out of psychedelics without the psychedelic uh, psychedelic oh. effect. So like LSD without the without, hallucinations. Uh, yeah, it didn't work out. But uh, <laughs> did you hallucinate? <laughs> no, the product didn't work out. The uh -huh. company shut down, unfortunately. Uh -huh. uh, it was a good team. Uh, they tried really hard. It did have some advantages, but they were like meaningless compared to normal supplements out there. Um, I try to make sure that in my diet that uh, I get as well, like uh, some stuff like fenugreek, like with sprouts. Uh, fenugreek is magical. Uh, I mean, it, it, it improves the recovery amazingly. Um, when, when, when you don't sleep a lot, and it's not because I don't want to sleep, I can't. I, I tried, 
I, I just can't. You I just cannot sleep. Your mind doesn't sleep. No, I, I'm I'm just good with two to three hours, and ah. then if I do more, I, I just get a migraine. Okay. So uh, doctors thought, you know, he might have sleep apnea or this issue or that issue, maybe psychological. And I did all the sleep studies and everything, and there was like nothing wrong with me. I do get my REM sleep, and that's what matters. And uh, um, I don't know. I just. I currently enjoy this lifestyle, currently, for the time being. Um, I just want to be productive. I, uh, um, I want to work hard and, uh, you know, it's not like uh, I have a plan B. Uh, so my ability to work depends on my health and right. my ability to work. Right. Um, and uh, it's not like I have uh, any cushion or plan B or... Uh, a rich family or right. any of that stuff, you right. know? Right. So uh, I, I, it's not like I have a retirement plan waiting for me. I do have investments, but you know, when you invest in startups, uh, you're probably paper rich, but uh, that's it. I mean, it, it stops there. I don't do real estate. I don't do uh, any of the stuff, the traditional stuff that people Yeah, do. yeah, it's interesting because yeah. the passive income normally comes from that source. Yeah, and I don't do that. You don't do that. So I, I live periods of time when there is like extreme dryness of cash. Right. And suddenly, <laughs> you know. It's like living on the edge. It is. And actually, it put me in trouble a few times. Of course. Life. Like, uh, yeah, I had, I actually <laughs> went homeless a couple of times uh, because of, yeah, like, it's just funny that, you know, one day you have a few millions in the bank and then few months later you look and you're like what am I doing wrong here right because you can barely afford to eat and this was me in my 20s and I decided I'm not gonna do that again <laughs> so I decided I'm gonna be smarter than that I'm gonna have a cash making business at any time uh, that I operate I tried investing in real estate it just it doesn't work for me I mean oh, yeah? when you look at uh, value of money Mm. inflation uh, and how much you gain from real estate it's close to a zero not a zero sum game close to mm. um, I mean there are experts who know how to do it well and they know they how to do their stuff mm. but I don't have the patience for the life cycle of real estate I'm not yet looking to create generational wealth I'm actually more like trying to create something new and help others create something new um, I don't know what am I doing exactly. It's not like I have a plan, right? But I just like to have fun, and this is my fun. <laughs> interesting. This is a very, very unique answer, I must say. Um, it's, it's very interesting. You also mentioned openly that you said you don't you don't work out. Uh, minimum hours, two to three hours of sleep. You openly talk about uh, nootropics that you take, which are legal. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're all legal, like yeah, yeah. mushrooms. Which you can buy, uh, you can buy here in the UAE, or you have uh, you, to... they even there's like a new startup that uh, I was looking at to invest in. They actually grow it as well here. They grow it here as well. Yeah, which which is uh, quite an advancement because the climate doesn't really allow that. But they they have built these microclimates and uh, enclosures to actually grow um, uh, edible mushrooms uh, right. here. Right. Uh, and these are not the psychedelic ones. No, they're, of course. They're not. Uh, they're designed to be more productive and stimulation. They're non magical. Non magical. <laughs> Except in the medical uh, sense, maybe they do have almost like magical uh, advantages. Mm. Um, I, I like when I when I take chaga, I don't feel I want to have coffee. Okay. It actually it replaces, replaces it. It does. And um, during the Cold War, uh, there were a few countries in East, in Eastern Europe that actually went to chaga instead of coffee. This is how it got discovered. Uh, chaga is called. A chaga. Chaga. Chaga is, um, so uh, when you look at antioxidants like uh, asparagus and blueberry, the value of antioxidants in chaga is exponential in comparison. I don't want to quote figures because uh, I don't remember any, but it's like a 40, 30x figure something of that range. Uh, Chaga is truly, mm. it's called, uh, they call it the uh, nature's, uh, nature's uh, black oil, uh, well, black gold, sorry. Gold. Yeah. And you can, buy these, you can buy these in pharmacies or only online? 
So if you want to buy a powder, you can buy the powder in some pharmacies here. Um, it's just not uh, widely uh, demanded, so you don't find it everywhere. Um, if you want to buy the tint texture, the, the drops, basically, you can buy on, that. On your online. eyes, is it? No, no, under your tongue. Under your tongue. Oh, yeah. okay. Just leave it to mix with the saliva, and that's basically. But uh, I, I actually know a few pro gamers, like some of the top people in the world, and they actually use mushrooms for uh, better sports. Okay. Reflexes. Reflexes. Uh, like uh, I meant e-games. E-games. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Right. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really interesting topic. I'm uh, learning about this. I mean, I heard about uh, microdosing. You know, Silicon Valley people, there's been articles about them using microdosing. Uh, so I'm not too surprised, but I didn't know you do that. <laughs> so where we are, there are things that are legal. We try to yeah, navigate of that. Of course. <laughs> um, but uh, even when it comes like there are a lot of amazing uh, uh, research, uh, research centers like Johns Hopkins. Uh, uh, they, they actually have, have done a lot of uh, work in that area. Um, the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Psychedelic uh, Research. At, uh, they, they have found some non-psychedelic replacements for some of the uh, compounds that do have psychedelic effects um, and come with the same uh, cognitive uh, advantages that you get you know, from that stuff without the uh, um, negatives, let's call them, based where you are. So, uh, I, I, like, I grew up with, uh, I wasn't good at school, and I have, I had had issues in, like, uh, reading, uh, uh, attention-wise, and uh, I kind of, it's, it's a mixture of behavior, and also some of the uh, biohacking techniques. Uh, yeah, it, it does work. Uh, I mean, even your metabolism can kick up your metabolism just by taking, uh, you know, the cold, uh, the, the sub-zero uh, nitrogen tanks. Yes, those. Uh, that that can really affect your metabolism in a big way. Um, uh, flotation tanks are the best thing for your body. It's like going to a chiropractor. Um, uh, float, like flotation tanks, there, there is only one left in Dubai that I know of. There were like two and now just one. It's this water that's extremely saturated with salt that you can sleep on top of. And uh, it's called the sensory deprivation tank. Mm. Okay. So it's basically your body stop, uh, all your senses stop working. Working. Because there's no light, no smell, no sound. The water temperature is matching to your body temperature, so your skin feels like there's nothing there because also the density of the water is really high and you're just a thought now. Wow. Like it almost removes your physicality from your mind. And if you sleep in a flotation tank for like half an hour, it's almost equivalent, in my opinion, to at least a full night's sleep. Wow. It, 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 it is really good for your circadian rhythm and uh, it has a lot of advantages, uh, I mean, many. Uh, a lot of uh, studies uh, also use it for like focus and meditation and thinking. Uh, a lot of uh, pregnant uh, women use it as well uh, to alleviate a lot of the uh, difficulties they have during pregnancy. But it is quite uh, an experience. I mean, mm. it, extremely relaxing, wow. uh, at least to say. And you come up with original ideas and it helps you uh, Brevity, a lot. Interesting. And it's a treatment. This is a proper treatment. Is yeah, it? I mean, or... anybody can uh, can do it. You can. Uh, some people actually buy the pods in, in their homes as well. Okay, you just buy the pod and then go in it, turn off the lights. Yeah, that's it. Sit and in it. Yeah, it, it usually the it, they're quite expensive. The pods. Yes, so, I imagine. Uh, yeah, it actually like prepares the brine, uh, which is like the water and the salt, right. and uh, regulates its temperature and then uh, you just have it ready, you just go uh, and lay there. Now, unless you have a cut, you shouldn't feel anything. Interesting. If you have yes. a cut, just put some Vaseline on it and it's good to <laughs> go. fine. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's quite the experience, especially now like with devices, you know, always of like course. phones and screens. Mm. When you go into that and you're awake and you're doing that, I thought I'm going to get this device anxiety. 
you know when your phone is separated from you you're like yeah. trying to look for it to check it check it you forget that it's not with you because you're not mindful that it's with you when you're using it so no i didn't get that weirdly enough interesting it's a good uh, there must be a i mean look this this it sounds like you know the movie Daredevil. Uh, if you've seen it, the very with Ben Affleck. Yeah. He okay. sits. He's he's blind naturally, so he sits in the in the bathtub and he's it's dark, and he just lays there. He sleeps there, and this sounds like what you're describing. So, um, I know this is gonna sound funny, um, but uh, in the late 70s and 80s, the uh, American government, through different uh, security bodies, had. Uh, departments to research uh, psychic abilities into defense and uh, I, I mean I'm, I'm quite open-minded to keep like the possibility of everything possible but <laughs> it doesn't sound plausible to me right but yeah but they actually uh, used uh, basically sensory deprivation tanks to bring this group of people and tell them that, to focus on their thoughts and do you see the hostage do you see them anywhere and stuff like that so there is a lot of uh, different uh, uh, well there are some uh, unclassified documents now about it but there there are uh, a lot of uh, different stories about this and you mentioned daredevil but there are other uh, um, uh, you know strange stranger things Stranger things yeah so uh, I haven't watched it but I've seen the scene where uh, seven I think uh, the uh, the girl at the beginning uh, okay. like I think like it starts with her in a uh, sense of deprivation tank. Tank. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Lots of. Yeah. I mean, you need to disconnect sometimes. Of course and you do. When you're like stressed for time. Not sometimes, but at least once a day meditation, at least. Yeah. But this is like maybe this is something you could do once a once a week or once a month. Once a week is really good, and you can. The beauty about this is that you get the value of a long break. Well, not a very long break, but. A value of a weekend in an hour. In an hour. Almost. I, this is how it feels to me, at least. Was it expensive when you did it? No, it's quite affordable. Uh, I mean, it ranges from like, uh, I think, $100 around. Okay. For like uh, an hour. Hour and a half, if hour I'm not half. mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's something I need to look into. And they got packages and stuff. And, yeah. And that's something I need to look into. Nootropics as well, I need to look into. Uh, mushrooms. Damn. Okay, very nice. <laughs> a very interesting discussion. I'm really glad we took down this different path. Psychology, because psychology is everything, end of the day. I, there's no producti productivity without your brain. Your brain needs to be at its best to be at its optimistic levels. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, if, if you, if you want to have a uh, mentality of success, right. you can't get that from a place where you're defeated mentally. Correct. Um, and Sometimes it, it might seem, especially for like founders, it might, it might seem that they're being delusional. Mm -hmm. And uh, people think that's not healthy, they need, need to get a reality check. I would say it's a coping mechanism, it's okay. It's okay to actually uh, believe sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, uh, it has a name actually, it's called emotional agility. Okay. So, uh, people who can actually obtain emotional agility uh, can actually go uh, into their second wind, per se, into life. And, and that is a territory that very few... And being a founder, I actually think it's almost like a form of being an athlete. Right. The amount of punches you take and the amount of... Uh, Emotional and mental agility you need yes. is uh, unbelievable. Yes, people start questioning your uh, sanity even sometimes yes. because uh, you need to get into the zone where you're humble but confident. Yes. You're uh, rolling with the punches, very agile, but yet you're actually planning for the future. So uh, it has a lot of contradictions. Right, right. It this leads me to my next question: um, How do you manage all this along with having kids? Do you have weekends with them? Do you go on picnics with them? Do you go? Do you do you go to the cinema with them? How do you manage all this along with your family? Uh, 
Probably I'm not a very great father. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I they they don't, they they're not here. Uh, they're in different countries. Countries. With okay. My ex-wife. Okay. Uh, and uh, when it comes to my kids, yeah, I do have the daily or by daily every two days uh, FaceTime call FaceTime with them. Call. Um, and uh, they're still young, uh, seven and eleven. Okay. A boy and a girl, and uh, they're cute. They're try to act like they need help with their homeworks. Uh, <laughs> I know, yeah. And uh, uh, I try to at least once every month and a half to, or once a month or month and a half to actually go and have like quality time with them, yeah. at least for a day. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, when it comes to time management, to tell you the truth, I don't manage. Yeah, same. I don't manage. I don't manage. I do follow my calendar, I do. I respect it religiously, but uh, it just happens. I do have priorities and I would cancel anything on my calendar for the priorities that I've got, but I don't manage um, and I try to embrace the beauty of chaos. Mm. Uh, I do have values that drive me. Right. I do have uh, output and deliverables that I'm laser focused on, and that's it. Right. I, I go. I openly make the statement that um, time, time management, and in general, the work-life balance is a scam. It is a scam. It is a scam. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I, I mean, agree. You have one life. You're one person. The mental pressure of having to be two different people to achieve work-life balance yeah. is an imbalance by its own definition. Right. I mean, why do I need? I mean, uh, like when I when I work with my team, I ask them, like, you're not feeling okay? That's okay. Just be be yourself. You don't have to come and wear a mask, you know, of being okay at yeah. work. Yeah. Right. Right. Being professional and no, come on, just leave, go, have a day at the beach. You're not feeling okay. Uh, I mean, we, we work in a very stressful uh, industry, uh, tech in general. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, when things happen in your life, uh, it's better to just take a sidebar and mm. accept it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to not be okay. And it's good to know the difference because you only know that you're okay by not being okay. Yep. By knowing the low, you know what a high is. 100% and you need to prioritize and if you don't put yourself at at least near number one or number one and actually no not near you have to be your number one priority right in a way that enables you to save those you actually care about in your life right otherwise it's just uh, meaningless you know yeah, yeah. fantastic yeah. we'll leave it there it was a wonderful, insightful discussion. Yeah, thank we didn't, you for having me. Man. No, thank you for coming on. We didn't just talk metrics and what we, you need to do this, you need to advice, blah, 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 the usual. We talked a lot of, this was an adventurous conversation and very, very comforting. Yeah. It's okay to not be okay. 100%. I really want to resonate that with the audience. So thank you, Jamil, for your time. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for watching. Hope you find this insightful. Um, the, the release of this podcast will be shown and all of Jamil's wonderful, uh, wonderful um, uh, entrepreneur and description will be in the description of the YouTube video. But thank you for watching. Um, keep following the page. Stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Cheers.